Welcome in Wabbers, where today's topic is part one of a two-part series which we'll be doing over the next two nights for Wednesday's class, and that's the spread of communism. We probably may not even look at a lot of this in class, so your content knowledge here that you're gaining from this ATW is imperative to your progress towards that AP exam and those comprehensive exams. So, we left off today in class with the death of Mao Zedong. China's Communist Party leader for nearly 30 years. And through the Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong tried to eliminate his rivals. But when Mao died, an interesting development <clears throat> occurred in China. Mao's successor, a man named Deng Xiaoping, and I'll spell that for you all in class. I'm not going to have time to put pictures and titles in here today because of the afternoon being packed with baseball game, by the way, so you have to just listen and kind of copy. Deng Xiaoping was Mao's successor, and Deng Xiaoping, one of his first duties was that he arrested many of Mao's former allies and had them imprisoned, sort of keeping them accountable, responsible for the Cultural Revolution. But another aspect of Deng Xiaoping that is so important to answering multiple choice questions on the AP exam is that Deng Xiaoping instituted numerous reforms, economic reforms, that began to open China economically. China had been closed off from most world economies. They were very isolated. Mao's collectivism, Mao's version of communism kept China very isolated. But Deng Xiaoping's reforms certainly open the floodgates for China to become the economic behemoth that it is in the present 2019. China is a fascinating case study of a government that is communist. The, the shrouds of communism still fall very heavily upon mainland China. But Deng Xiaoping began the process that eventually future Chinese leaders would also embrace, which is the idea of China being economically liberal, economic liber liberalism, you know, free market capitalism, but socially communist and politically communist as well. So if you can keep that in mind, China was socially and politically communist, but it was economically liberal, economically capitalist. So China starts to shift again. That, that's a change over time. Mao's departure, his death, led to China's economic liberalization. So that's why on the mock, you guys probably recall seeing the pictures of Chinese communists with the Coca-Cola logo behind them. And that is a juxtaposition for how at one point in Chinese history, capitalism could equate and lead to someone's death for being too much a practitioner of capitalism. You were the enemy of the state. But after Mao's death and Deng Xiaoping and future Chinese reforms, economic liberalism has come to China. And it remains being one of the reasons why today in China, things like free speech, freedom of the press, those are not rights the Chinese have. Uh, that was why in the 1980s, you had the famous protester who stood in front of a tank um, he was not run over, by the way, but he stood in front of a tank to protest some of the lack of free speech that the communist government in China continues to utilize to suppress people's freedoms, a hallmark of all communist governments. But nonetheless, China migrated its economy towards capitalism, and that's what began the process of China becoming a worldwide leader in, global, in the global economy and the whole made in China, everything seemingly becoming made in China, that movement, again, stems from the fact that the Chinese opened up their economies and made them much more liberal. Now, as far as the spread of communism in Asia, China was certainly not the only country in Asia, or even in its own region. Right next door to China, in the 1940s and 50s, a civil war between communists and non-communists erupted in Korea. The Korean War, excuse me, is a wonderful example of how communism spread throughout Asia. 
The Korean War was fought between 1950 and 1953, and it will go down in history as being the very first war the United Nations sent peacekeeping forces into battle. This was a new uncharted territory for the United Nations. And the United Nations fielded an army of mostly American troops. Because in America, as you learned last year with Ms. Cole, the United States' policy towards Asia, once China, once China converted to communism, the United States took, a, took what was called the domino theory and tried to apply it to Asia. Meaning that if China falls, then the next country falls, and so on and so on and so on. That was a true fear of the United States. The domino theory dictated a lot of American policy, foreign policy. So with the domino theory in mind, Truman, President Truman, in 1950, was able to commit American soldiers towards the UN peacekeeping forces, allowing America to try to do something about the spread of communism in Korea. Now, the end result of the Korean War was some 50,000 deaths um, I'm sorry, some 30,000 American lives lost, millions of Korean lives lost, and Chinese lost. Mao sent Chinese forces into North Korea to help defend the spread of communism in North Korea. And that's ultimately why Korea wound up split. There was really an indecision in terms of who won the war. It was declared a stalemate. But in the North, a communist government wound up being in power, and in the South, a democratic, a more democratic government took over in the South of Korea. So Korea, excellent example of where communism spread throughout Asia. And Korea would not be the only place that wound up being divided between North and South. In the 1950s, the Vietnamese peoples rebelled successfully and declared their independence from France. It was a bloody war in the 1950s to fight for their independence. The leader of that independence movement is a man named Ho Chi Minh. And we're going to look at some documents. I think on Wednesday we're going to do a lot of like primary source work. I'm going to show you a lot of documents that relate to this material, so there will be a chance for review questions. But Ho Chi Minh, who was educated in both France and the Soviet Union, Ho Chi Minh became the figurehead leader of the colonial movement against the French. Ho Chi Minh also happened to be a communist. And after the Vietnamese were able to expel the French, communism began to grow in certain parts of Vietnam, especially North Vietnam. And before you know it, there was a growing sensation of communism that was spreading throughout Vietnam, just like it had spread uh, in Korea. The United States this time did not use the United Nations as cover. Instead, the United States took a direct role in trying to stop the spread of communism from North to South Vietnam. And that's where in the 1960s to 70s, you get into what's known as the Vietnam War. Now, the Vietnam War is a classic example in the Cold War of how America and the Soviet Union tried to influence the world with its policies without fighting each other directly. That's what's known as a proxy war, when the two superpowers don't fight each other. We've talked about that term before. Regardless, the Vietnam War, like the Korean War, was a bloody conflict that cost thousands of American lives. Some 50,000 Americans died fighting in the Vietnam War. But millions of Vietnamese were killed, and millions of Vietnamese were forced to flee their country to find a, a better home, whether it be in Indonesia, whether it be in Australia, whether it be in the United States or Canada, millions of Vietnamese left Vietnam as the war was going on and as the war was ending to escape communism, which took root in Vietnam. And communism didn't stop in Vietnam. Uh, nearby countries, Cambodia and Laos, also converted to communism. And in Cambodia, you have one of the worst cases of registered genocide as a result of the communist government that took over in Cambodia and began targeting non-communists and ethnic groups in Cambodia. The leader of that Cambodian communist group was a man named Pol Pot. P-O-L space P-O-T. Pol Pot. Pol Pot was a communist. He led a group known as the Khmer Rouge, 
which was a nickname. Rouge in French is red, and the Khmer was an ancient Southeast em uh, Asian empire. And Pol Pot's regime in the 1970s killed millions of people, which has been one of the defined examples of genocide in world history. So it's a startling development in Asia that with the spread of communism in Asia, boy, you have all over the continent now communist governments, China, North Korea, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, five countries in Asia, five countries in Asia converted to communism after World War II. So the United States was holding its breath. The domino theory seemingly was becoming true, but the threat at home for the United States was very minimal. Yet abroad, communism was, was finding appeal in Asia, especially Mao's sort of vision of communism, which was influencing and bringing together the peasants. And that is ultimately something, again, to take away from the effect of Mao Zedong. His version of communism involving the peasant class, which differed greatly from Karl Marx, Mao's vision of communism was carried on throughout some of the revolutions that took place in East and Southeast Asia. So I'm going to leave you guys with that. Asia was heavily influenced by communism. Tomorrow, part two, we're going to talk about the spread of communism to other regions of the world, including Latin America. Communism is going to have a big impact in Latin America, as well as we'll talk briefly about the spread of communism into Africa as well. So I'll leave you guys with part one for tonight. Remember, this is due to be watched by Wednesday when we're going to look at some direct primary source uh, materials. All right. Well, have a great evening, Wappers. Take care. And as always, you know, the drill by now, the past shapes the future. Have a good one.